Thank you for joining us on the Rose Church Podcast. For more information about this podcast or other resources, please visit rosechurch.org or follow us on social media at Rose Church PDX. All right, here we go. I'm going to go to the Bible this morning. Uh, If you have a Bible, you can find with me and follow. If not, you can follow with the screen. I'll have some stuff up there. We're going to talk from an Old Testament passage. We're going to talk from Jeremiah chapter 18. So if you want to go there, I'll meet you there in a while. Uh, Jeremiah was one of the Old Testament prophets that prophesied hundreds of years before Christ. Jeremiah prophesied to Israel. There were two houses, you know, the house of Israel actually split into two houses. There was the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The house of Israel had 19 evil kings, and the house of Judah had eight good kings out of their 19. And so both houses had their problem. The house of Israel had the worst problem because they were the most idolatrous, immoral, backslidden against God. Jeremiah is prophesying to those people. So he's, he's prophesying to people that have lost hope. Uh, they're backslidden. Uh, they're away from God. They've been away from God for many, many years. And when God calls Jeremiah to go to this group of people to prophesy, God says to him, they're not going to listen to you. Matter of fact, they're going to reject your words. They're going to persecute you. You're going to have a very hard ministry, which he did for over four decades, prophesying to a nation that never, ever responded to anything he had to prophesy. They were rejectors of the word of the Lord. So Jeremiah, being the person he is, he's prophesying to this group of people. It's a hard group, and he's trying to give them hope, but they won't receive it. They won't receive it. God, they won't receive it. And so God is trying to say to Jeremiah, even though they reject you, I'm not rejecting them. I've made covenant with them, and I'm never going to reject them. Even though you don't feel their response, even though you will be hurt by them, I just want you to know I am for them, and I'm going to, I'm going to keep trying to give them hope and healing. I'm going to try to get them to return, and I need you to understand that's the way I am. I'm the God who goes after people who have no hope. I'm the God who goes after people who don't respond. I'm the God who goes after people who don't know me. I'm the God who goes after people who reject me, blaspheme me, and most people would judge them and say they're the most irreligious people. They have no respect for God. God is saying to Jeremiah, it doesn't bother me. I'm not turned by that. I'm a God of everlasting mercy, everlasting grace, everlasting reach. I will keep reaching to them all the days of your life. Now, Jeremiah is hearing this word, and and yet he still has to deliver it. So God says, listen, this is what we'll do. I want to give you a word picture that will get you to understand exactly the message that I'm trying to get to this group of backslidden or non-God people that you are going to be involved with. And he says, so I want you to go down, and I want you to pick it up with me. It's on the screen, Jeremiah chapter 18. Paul also quotes this scripture in the New Testament, chapter 9 of Romans. And so Paul quotes Jeremiah specifically about this specific word that he had in Jeremiah chapter 18. Matter of fact, songs have been written about this scripture. Preachers have preached it for hundreds of thousands of times. And Paul, of all the prophecies he could have picked up from Jeremiah, he picked up this one because this was the prophecy of hope. This was the same Israel that Paul was dealing with in his apostolic days that were still God rejectors away from God. And there was nothing going on with the synagogue on that day. Paul was up against it. And so he uses the same scripture. Now, am I talking too fast? Okay, I'm just in a hurry. I was born in a hurry. And so I talk in a hurry. And so I'm trying to get further down this message than I did the first one. Uh, Are you with me? Okay. Now, Jeremiah is going to go down to the potter's house to hear this word. He's going to hear it and see it. He's going to hear it and he's going to see it. And this is what Paul was saying to Israel. And I'm saying this to you for your personal life, whoever you are, however you got into the service today, however someone invited you, promised to buy you brunch or lunch, or maybe they invited you and said, hey, it's a cool church, you really, uh, you won't mind going, it's not like anything you've seen before, it's really comfortable, dress however you want, and then you kind of get somehow into the service, and maybe you're not a church person, or a God person, or a salvation person, or a Jesus person, it doesn't matter, what I'm going to say to you will have application 
addition to your life. Why? Because God brought you here because he loves you and he's going to do a marvelous work in your life. And you're here in the sovereignty of God. Even though you don't understand that, you're here in the sovereignty of God and you're here to hear this message that Jeremiah heard and he saw. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go to the potter's house. Everyone say out loud, potter's house. Potter's house. And there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house. Say potter's house. Potter's house. And there he was making something. Everyone say out loud with me, making something. Making something. Making something. So he goes down to the potter's house. And God is talking to him, and there's the potter working with the clay. And Jeremiah is hearing the word of the Lord, and, and he says about this potter, I went down to the potter's house, and he was on the wheel, and he was making something. I, I, I couldn't tell what it was. I couldn't tell what kind of a vessel would turn out. I couldn't tell if it would be a good or bad. I couldn't tell what it would be used for later on in the empire or in someone's house. All I knew is that there was clay on the potter's wheel and the potter was making something. And I want to say to you this morning, you're on the wheel and God is making something. People can't see it. People don't know it. People could never prophesy it. People could never predict what's going on in your life. You might be the kind of person that people will read into it bad things and you won't achieve and you're at failure and you you're, 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 whatever. But if you are in the hands of the potter and you're on the potter's wheel, that potter is making something. And when God starts to work, he is a good God and he's making something good. Even though you can't see it, even though you can't respond to it, even though people can't interpret it, I want you to know you're on the potter's wheel and God is making something. Now, keep, keep looking at the scripture. You got to follow me. If not, we will remove you in Jesus' name. No, no. Now, now watch this next line. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred. Simply messed up. Flawed, cracked, wrong in the hand of the potter. Now listen, keep watching the scripture. So he made it again. He made it again. Everyone say again. Amen. Now, even though you're on the potter's will, and even though even after you get into the making of what God wants to make and something is going on in your life and you still have some flaws, uh, just put that on hold for a moment and respond to me. How many here would have a few flaws in your life? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Turn to your neighbor and say, lift your hand, buddy. <laughs> what? How, how many of you have ever had some serious failures? Yeah. How many have ever tried to give up on yourself? Yeah. How many have had other people give up on you? Yeah. How many have had the thought, well, we could keep going down the road. You got the, what I'm talking about. You're messed up. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're messed up. You're messed up. In the hand of the potter. So what's he do with a messed up piece of clay? He throws it away. He gets rid of it. There's nothing he can do about it. That's not what my Bible says. It says he made it again into another vessel as seen good to the potter. God never gives up on you. Did we sing that song this morning about never give up? That seemed to be in my head. How's it go? He Love never fails, never gives up. Never gives up, never gives up. Never gives up, never gives up. It, 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 that. Okay. I'm going to read it from another translation. It's not on the screen, but you can listen. Message translation. God told Jeremiah, up on your feet. Go to the potter's house, and when you get there, I'll tell you what I had to say. So I went to the potter's house, and sure enough, the potter was there working away at the wheel. Whenever the pot the potter was working on turned out badly, I like this phrase, as sometimes happens when you're working with clay. The potter would simply start over, come on, shout, start over, start over, and use the same clay to make another 
vessel, another vessel, even though there's flaw, even though there's problem, even though there's something wrong. Now here's a quote. I'm going to put a quote up on, on the screen here. Um, this is a quote from a great man. Uh, I couldn't find anybody that said it the way I wanted, so this is my quote. You know, you quote all kinds of people. I'm quoting myself. <laughs> Anyone can spot greatness in greatness, but only God can see greatness in nothingness. Flawed, weak, failed people. Only God can look at something that has nothing. There's no hint of success. There's no hint of prosperity. There's no hint of wholeness. There's no hint that this person would have uh, the kind of talent or the success or the impact or whatever in their life. And you, you would write them off. You, why? Because we look at the outward and God looks at the heart. We look at the outward and God looks at the heart. We write people off and God never writes people off. He writes people in, we write people off. He writes people in and we write people off. Why? Because God can see greatness in nothingness. Even though you're disguising it, even though people can't see it, even though you have angles of your life that people try to understand, I'm going to tell you right now, God is a great God, and he's called you to a great life, and he's doing a great work in you, and you're on the potter's wheel, and there's something great going to happen in your future, and your destiny, and God's not going to give up on you, and even if you're flawed, he's going to take the clay and make it all over again. That's the God you serve. Even if you don't know that God, that's the God we're talking about. Michelangelo taking a block of stone up to his workspace. And someone said, what, what are you doing with the block of stone, Michael? He says, no, that's not a block of stone. That's an angel. I'm just going to chisel some things around and let it free because I see in that block of stone the angel. Michelangelo over and over again would talk about what he saw in his work that nobody else could see. I want you to know that there's something in you that God is chiseling away at. He's making. He's doing something that's going to be great. He's doing something that's going to be awesome. He's doing something that's going to surprise you. He's not going to give up on you even though others and sometimes ourselves we give up because stuff happens. I'm telling you right now, God is not going to give up on you. Who would have known when, when Tammy went to Jesse's house, you know, back in the Old Testament, and they were looking for a king, and Tammy said, bring in, bring in your, your sons, and they brought in the sons, and, and Tammy uncorked his horn to pour the oil on the lie of the oldest of the sons, and he said, surely this is the Lord's anointed. I'm going to anoint him to be king, and the Lord says, put the cork back on the horn. That is not the king. Yeah, he's tall, he's good looking, he's strong, his personality, his charisma, he got everything. And that's where you hear the famous scripture, God looks at the heart, man looks at the outward. Man sees what man wants to see, but God sees what man can't see. And so God looks at your heart. God looks at your something way down deep inside of you that God loves about you, and God is coming after. And all the sons were rejected that day, and God chose David, the last son. And the prophet said, do you have any other boys? He says, I have one boy. He's out in the, you know, the backside of the desert. He's kind of a spacey musician, poet, uh, you know, creative guy you know he he doesn't follow through on stuff sometimes he forget things he he plays with his harp all the time a bear snuck up almost ate all the sheep but he dropped his harp and finally killed the bear but that's the kind of guy you're dealing with here he's just a little different and when he came in God says that's my guy what do you mean? He's not king-like. He's not personality. He, he's freckled face, red hair, and sunburn. He's, he's, he's just a kid. He's, he's got sheep dung between his toes. He's, he's, he's a, he, no, you can't make him the king. God can make anything he wants out of anyone he wants because he's that God. He looks at the clay of the wheel, and I think it's one of the things in heaven that God says, guess what I'm making? I don't know. I mean, we've been watching you with this one. We're not sure. That kid? Yeah, what about? He's going to be a king. Oh, give me a break. God, this is heaven conversation with the angels. Give me a break. Come on, God. He's not a king material. I know. I'm going to put the king material 
in him. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make him what I want him to be. I'm going to shape him into what I want him to be. What you see is not what he will be. What you see is where he is now, but you don't see where I'm going to take him. So what you see in yourself right now is not the person you're going to become. And, and don't live backwards, live forward. And trust my word today, you're, you're in the hands of the potter. All right, God is making everyone say something. Sorry. A thing that is nondescript, something that's hidden. It's, I mean, who would, have, who would have ever thought with John Newton, uh, the guy who wrote Amazing Grace Helm, who would have ever thought? If you would have met him in his first 50 years of life, he was a mess. He was an immoral man. He was an abusive man. He owned a slave ship and one of, one of the worst slave captains of the day. He was, uh, if you read his life story, it, it is horrible. You, you can't even imagine a man could be as evil as John Newton was. Even his own family rejected him. He was such an evil man. He got saved. When he got saved, he left his past. Ultimately, he put it behind him but he had a horrible past. And so he felt called to the ministry. And so he wanted to preach, but he's way late in life. He has no theological degree, no theological training. He has no backing. He has nothing. He's way late in life. So he interviews with seven major denominational headquarters in the nation of England. All of them rejected him. For seven years, they rejected him. He could not find one person that would listen to him except one bishop. One day, he had an interview, finally the guy saw him. This is seven years later now. And as he shared his heart, the bishop started crying. He was, oh my God, what a story. What a, what a man, what a heart. Tell me more about your testimony. And as John Newton shared, he melted this bishop's heart. He melted that room to nothing. And the grace of God was on him. And the bishop says, I will ordain you, and I will put you in a church if you promise me you will preach the grace that's on you, and you will tell your story. Because there are so many broken people in England, and so many failed people, and so many beat up people, and there's so many people that don't think they belong in the church. But you, you have the grace of God on you, and, and God has remade you. And now they're both weeping. They're in this office going through this experience. I want you to know that whoever you are, and what Whatever you've gone through, God will use everything for your message. He'll use everything for you to get to other people. Even your worst failure is your best testimony. Even the thing that you hate to even look at, that dysfunctionality, that problem in the past, I'm telling you right now, God doesn't waste any pieces in your life. He will use every single piece of your life, and he will build it back under the grace of God. Why? Because we're all here today because of the grace of God. There is there's no other reason. It's the grace of God. So it's Newton who disciples William Cowper, who was one of the best writers and poets of the day, but he was suicidal. He tried three times to kill himself. So John Newton took him under his wing. He became one of the most read writers of the day. William Wilberforce, who was the guy who stopped slavery in England, he gave up totally because he had for years and 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 years, all his whole life, he was at the end of his life, and nothing was done that he was trying to pass. It was John Newton that took William under his wing and said, William, don't give up. Please don't give up. Please, God is with us. God will help you. We will get through this. Why? A broken person can really understand broken people. A, dis a person who's gone through a lot of discouragement understand discouraged people. A person who lives by a train track understand trains. It's okay. No. All right, how many of you are getting something out of this? God is making something. Okay, 
Next slide. God the potter is on a mission, and you're the mission. He has intentions for you, and you're the mission. He's doing something in your life, and you're the mission. He is uh, planning, and he is designing, even though you can't see all the designs that he has for you. God can hit home runs with broken bats. And so God goes after those broken people. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 1.26, For you see your calling, brethren and sistren, that not many wise, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen, 1 Corinthians 1, 26, the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And then he, it's like Paul ran out of illustrations to, to tell you, if you're not mighty, if you're foolish, if you're weak, if you're base, God. And so then he comes up with the last phrase here and he says even the things which they're uh, things that are not they, they don't they, they're nothing they don't even exist that God uses the are nots the God uses the base the weak the foolish to confound the wise and the strong if you are base and foolish and unwise and full of mistakes and have a lot of dysfunctionalities in your past or a little bit of dysfunctionality or brokenness or people abuse you or things have happened I'm telling you you are called of God and God, hand is on you, making you. The vessel was marred in the hands of the potter. Okay, I've said enough about that. Uh, maybe. The clay, make a few statements about the clay. Everyone say out loud, I am the clay. I am the clay. Okay, say, say out loud with the, I'm on the wheel. And he's making something. Come on, making something. Now, now add to it, something good. Do you really believe you're something good? You are. And when that vessel is marred, you, you, you know, the Hebrew and Greek language is so wonderful to study, so much more colorful than the English language. But the Hebrew word used for marred means damaged. Have you ever had anybody say to you, I have, in my years of pastoring, a lot more than once. Have you ever had anybody say to you, I'm damaged goods, Pastor Frank. There's not much I can hope for because I'm just damaged goods. I, I got so many things broken in me, I don't even see how I could ever be a whole person. I just want you to know that your name is in the Bible and your description is in the Bible and damaged goods is in the Bible and Jesus specializes in damaged goods. He specializes in brokenness. He specializes in those that are spoiled and flawed, corrupted, messed up. No matter how badly we have messed up, how terrible our mistakes, how miserable our failures. God says, I, I choose you. I've heard people say these things to me. Have you said this? I messed up my life so badly that I can't even imagine God has any further plans. I know I turned to Jesus at one point in my life, but I keep blowing it so bad. I'm not sure I can come back. I hate myself. I'm just really messed up. I messed up, Pastor Frank. I made really bad, bad decisions. Now I seem to be wandering in darkness. I want desperately to return to Jesus and be put back together again, but it seems so far away for me. I can't really even imagine God healing what is broken inside of me. We live in a nation of broken people. We live in a nation of people that are quietly broken, living brokenness in silence. They dress their brokenness up in personality and in gifts and in suits and in cars and in houses and careers, but the brokenness is still there and it lies there and it perverts the personality. It takes them down a dark path and doesn't let them become the vessel that God is making on the wheel. But I'm going to declare to you today that God has the power to redo. God has the power to remake. God has the power to restore. God has the power to do something 
something in that vessel that will not just remove the external things about you, but the very core of the thing that causes you to be messed up can be healed. That's the gospel. He's the God who has the power. He has the authority. He has the love. He has the ability. And he has you. He has you. Say, well, I don't have him. You don't have to. He's got you. Bow your head. Bow your head just out of respect for others around you, maybe, or whatever. You don't have to, but maybe just bow your head, close your eyes. Let me ask you two questions in 30 seconds. Because God hears the heart response. If you're in the room today, and you would say, you know what, Frank? I messed up. I know that. Or my life is off track. I know that. But I want God to do something in my life that would be mighty and magnificent. I want to get back on track. I want to return to Jesus, or I want to find Jesus. I want to stay on that wheel, and I'm going to believe that God can make this vessel over again. But I'm here today to surrender my life to Jesus or get back on track to Jesus. Lift your hand right now. Just lift your hand straight up. Say, Frank, you're talking to me. You're talking to me. I need Jesus. I need to get back on track. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Lift your hand. Anyone else? Right now, just lift it straight up. Nine, ten, eleven. Anyone else? Lift your hand right now and say, I'm coming home. I'm coming back. I want on that wheel. I want God to work in me. Anyone else? Lift your hand right now. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Lift your hand right now. Come on. It's seventeen. It, it might be a simple thing, but I'm telling you right now, God sees your heart. God hears your cry. God sees your response. And God is saying to you, I'm going to do something mighty in your life. It's not over. The book is going to be written. And I'm going to do something supernatural on this wheel. Anyone else? Anyone else right now? Just lift your hand straight up. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Got to be at least 20 that have lifted their hands. Now, they'll take care of you. Let me pray for you. I want everybody in the room to stand to their feet. And just out of a, a, a way to reach, would you just reach toward heaven? Just, just spread your hand toward heaven, which simply means you're saying to God this morning, I really need your help. I really need your help. Oh, God, I really need your help. I need healing. I need hope. I need to be on the wheel. I need a future. Oh, God, I came today, and I need this that's happening right now. Holy Spirit, come upon them from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. Let there be a shaping grace. Let there be a calling grace. Let there be a returning grace. Let there be a healing grace. Oh, God, we came into this room one way, but we will leave a different way. Lord, we came in with a mindset, but we will leave with a different mindset. God, you are for us. You are in us. You are around us. Thank you for listening to the Rose Church Podcast here on the Apollo Podcast Network. For more information and resources, please visit rosechurch.org or follow us on social media at Rose Church PDX.